talk a little bit about your data uh, looking at these drugs uh, in terms of their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier or elicit response rates in the brain. You've had some data mm -hmm. that was presented, I think, at World Lung, mm -hmm. uh, showing that there is uh, the potential for them to treat brain metastases. Right. So. Several years ago, we, we, you know, when these drugs were first starting to show activity, we, uh, yeah, we decided that we really wanted to look at um, how they worked in the brain. And I think, as Mark was saying, when a drug works elsewhere, it can work in the brain as well. And we, we think a lot about do, do drugs cross the blood-brain blood -brain barrier? And I think, to a large degree, they, they do. And you know, one, one question with immune therapy is, well, will, will the antibodies cross? One interesting point is the antibodies don't necessarily have to get in, right? You can activate T cells and they can get in. So it doesn't have to be that the drug is getting there, but the question is, can, is something getting there? And the idea is, can you use a systemic therapy instead of or you know, in addition to uh, a local therapy, like surgery sure. or radiation, or even avoid those t local therapies? Um, so we, uh, yeah, we've performed this trial and it's still actually ongoing. Um, but we do have some data now that we, we just published recently that, that shows that these drugs, or specifically with our trial, pembrolizumab, does work in the brain. So in patients with brain metastases that have not been radiated or those who have been radiated and then have progression, using pembrolizumab instead of another local therapy can be effective in the brain. You know, it, it, it's the, the response rate is no higher than the systemic response rate. You, couldn't, you can't imagine it would be more, but it does look to be the same. So in patients, in the study we did with melanoma and in lung cancer, it looks like it can be effective in the brain. I think it's really exciting yeah. for patients who have, in our study at least, smaller asymptomatic brain metastases. You can use immune therapy. And, and and, and get a good response the, the need for radiation if a patient progresses in the brain using these drugs? Is that something that we should be thinking about for these patients outside of a clinical trial right now? So, or? you know, our trial is small, and mm -hmm. it's kind of the first experience doing this, and we, so far we've um, published the data on um, 18 patients with lung cancer and 18 with melanoma. So. You have to take that right. <laughs> with what it is. We have seen several fantastic responses. We have had, we had four complete responses in the wow. brain. So I mean, and the small metastases, but really now gone. And, and the data we published several months of durable benefit, but now it's been over a year in some patients. So we've seen some really fantastic durable responses in the brain, and those patients have now been able to avoid radiation. And though some of those patients have had prior radiation, right. so it really is nice that they're able to get benefit systemically and in the brain. Should it be done outside of a trial? You know, sometimes patients are stuck and they already have had radiation and they can't get more or there's concern for toxicity. So I think it's a consideration. You have to be cautious because we have seen some issues um, in the brain. And so we monitor those patients really closely and we're always doing it in consultation with a neurosurgeon that we work very closely with and radiation oncologists to talk about you know, the pros and the cons of each strategy. And, you know, we've actually created a tumor board around this to, to really discuss these patients. They could be complicated, but I think it's a potential strategy you could yeah. consider. Yeah. Is there a patient outside of a patient who may have autoimmune diseases, <clears throat> excuse me, that you wouldn't give these drugs to? There's been some some hints from, from Checkmate study and from the Keynote 001 that molecular subsets, particularly EGFR positive patients, may not be the right patient for these types of drugs. Um, has that been your experience? We were giving these drugs to EGFR positive patients before uh, this data came out that said, you know what, this may not be the best option for these patients. Any, any thoughts on that? All right, so some of the, the, the trials that, that um, have looked at this have, have treated all comers and then looked at the subsets of KRAS positive and EGFR positive patients. And it does look that like uh, the, the EGFR mutation positive patients don't benefit as much from immune therapy compared to chemotherapy. Um, so I think it's become clear, I'm curious how other people interpret this data, I think it's become clear that there probably is less activity in patients with EGFR um, than, than uh, without. But we clearly have seen very significant benefit in patients with an EGFR mutation on immune therapy. So I would not say that it's something to avoid. It may be something that you want to um, sequence a bit differently than you would in other patients. So you know, these drugs are now approved in the second line for patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But I would say maybe in patients with EGFR, maybe you can extrapolate to ALK and other um, uh, diseases that tend to be in, in uh, you know, never light smokers. Um, maybe in those diseases you want to use other things first, but mm -hmm. I in no way would say that those patients or should not table. get okay. um, immune therapy. Mark, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that, and uh, I think I've shocked even some of my partners uh, that I, I would offer uh, somebody with an EGFR mutant or an ALK positive uh, cancer uh, nivolumab first line or nivolumab ipi. And the reason for that is I can't, I've, I've not been able to get a cure and 
any patient with those drugs. You would offer them first line in combination or just first line? First line. Okay. Because um, the, the, if you've seen these patients that have had these multi-year disease-free outcomes, there is no other therapy in stage four disease that can offer that. And in the, in the right patient, uh, with careful supervision, stopping the drug, I think it's totally reasonable in somebody who, who wants that approach to do that, and I, and I would do that. And table the TKI. And table the TKI. It, sadly, it's not a curative regimen, and in the places it could be curative, like in the adjuvant setting, I can't seem to get anybody interested in it. I'm the only one that gives that too. So, um, uh, but I, I, I do think it's a totally reasonable thing, and, and your point about it being less effective is, is correct. Uh, but in the right patient with that explanation, I think it can, it can happen. Um, n n there isn't another treatment that we have as medical oncologists that can give that longer remission with that few side effects. Okay. And you mentioned adjuvant, neoadjuvant, kind of, you know, want to put a plug in for the alchemist and, 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 and what it's, the efforts it's are doing. A, again, we, we're, we're trying to use these drugs in a curative setting and to try to use them to enhance cure. Do we know how to do that? Of course not. Uh, and there's a, a whole range of clinical trials initiating now giving these agents in the neoadjuvant setting, uh, both the single uh, agent PDL1 and PD1 drugs, and also uh, giving the combinations. And in the adjuvant setting, uh, just a couple weeks ago, there's been initiation of a uh, clinical trial to give nivolumab uh, in patients on the Alchemist study that do not have an ALK rearrangement or EGFR mutation. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I would um, uh, agree with the combination strategy with Nevia, Nevo and Ipi with the EGFR positive patients, only based on my own anecdotal experience that these drugs for me, at least in the resistance setting, haven't, have not worked. Um, I do think that there is a place uh, for these drugs that needs to be exploited and explored uh, in the neoadjuvant and the adjuvant setting. We need to learn more about how these uh, drugs work. Uh, we need pre-tissue and post-tissue after drug delivery to see the dynamic changes elicited by these agents. Um, but, 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 but point well taken that these drugs are, are, are providing the most durable responses we've seen. Uh, to date. Uh, given no, just say all, all three of us are part of the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium and all have Alchemist running too. Yes. So, yes. you know, I think we both, the uh, our three institutions, you know, support those those trials, mm -hmm. both yes. adjuvantly and adjuvantly. Okay. Govindan, your thoughts on, on where we sit currently, not future, but where we sit currently with, with the checkpoint inhibitors? You know, I think I agree with all the points made. Uh, second line setting is very clear. Uh, I think I think at the moment uh, we are trying to decide how to move them forward in the front line setting and how to combine them with other drugs to enhance the activity on this. I'm not so sure that I would offer uh, nivolumab to EGFR mutant patients in the front line setting, but definitely in the second or third line setting I would consider that.